Well, uh, thank you, Ron, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming out here uh, in the morning and uh, through the day to participate in this symposium. I wanted to say that this, uh, as Ron mentioned, this is my first time in Israel. It's been a wonderful visit and I've seen a lot. And so I'm right now just strategizing for excuses to, to come back again uh, sometime soon. Uh, so I'll get right to it because as I uh, often do, I've got way too many things to say. Uh, so I don't want to oppress everybody. Uh, so are we, uh, we good? Yeah. All right. Um, so I wanted to talk today about uh, the evolution of technology. And this uh, uh, speaks to a, uh, a larger issue, the perennial question, you know, of what makes uh, humans unique. And so when if you ask a question like that, a lot of people would, would point to uh, remarkable technologies like the Saturn V rocket that have uh, spread our species around the globe, you know, carried us into space. Uh, and I think that you can't really even begin to try to understand human evolution without uh, engaging with this long his co-evolutionary history that we have um, with technology. Uh, and so what I'd like to do today is to, to start off uh, hopefully with some, uh, some theoretical issues around the concept of the evolution of, of technology, and then to uh, move on to some uh, more uh, empirical uh, evidence of uh, specific evolutionary uh, mechanisms and neural mechanisms that might be involved. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Um, so, Humans uh, occupy a technological niche that we ourselves have constructed. So, I mean, if you look at something like this, this famous uh, picture of the Shibuya crossing in, uh, in Tokyo, um, arguably there's not a single thing in this image that's natural. Uh, you know, you've got the buildings of the cars, but even the bodies of the people in this, uh, in this image have been transformed by our long engagement with technology, uh, whether it's the reduction of, of the jaws and teeth from uh, cooking and food processing, uh, various modifications related to tool making and in, 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 in the hands and arms, transformations of the gut related to diet, and of course, our very large and energy hungry brain. Um, but the other thing that you can notice in this picture, of course, is that uh, there's so many people, right? Eight billion people on the planet now. And this is a bit of a conundrum for a uh, primate um, that has such a, a slow developmental process and a big expensive brain. Uh, so despite the cost of human children, uh, human women uh, have the highest fertility rate, lifetime fertility rate of, of any of the apes uh, in the shortest interbirth interval. And economically, this doesn't make sense. You know, women shouldn't be able to do this. Um, so people have thought about this, of course, and the general explanation for how women can do this is that they're assisted in, in reproduction, that um, it's not just uh, the mother, um, but also relatives and even people who are not related that are contributing time and effort to help subsidize reproduction. And so this is a human biocultural reproductive system um, that kind of makes everything work. Now, in order for some individuals to subsidize the reproductive efforts of other individuals, um, you have to actually make more than you eat at some point so that you can donate time or energy in some sense. Now, chimpanzees um, like basically don't do that. So their production and their consumption tracks very closely without, with, throughout the lifespan. Um, but human foragers, for instance, they start out, and you may have some experience with this, being very costly. Uh, and making much less than they actually require as children. But at some point, you actually start to overproduce and produce a surplus. And the reason humans are able to do this uh, is because of accumulated and culturally transmitted uh, skills, knowledge, abilities to harvest resources from the environment, which I would just sort of gloss and call that technology, right? So what this does is this creates a, the potential um, for very positive uh, biocultural feedback process um, whereby uh, technological uh, uh, innovations um, enable a greater resource capture, which uh, you know, allows surpluses and, and exchange, um, which supports uh, more costly children, longer developmental periods, larger populations, which are the necessary conditions for growing larger, uh, more complex brains, which theoretically may produce more technological innovations. So it's a round and round and round, and this is a very popular model uh, these days for, for human evolution, right? An important part of this scenario is that it's also the culture 
uh, that is evolving. And there's a whole field of, uh, of cultural evolution and particularly a, uh, a concept of cumulative cultural evolution or a ratchet effect in cultural evolution, uh, which is basically the argument that uh, generation after generation, other animals reinvent the wheel because they can't learn from each other very well, right? So every chimpanzee and every generation has to refigure out how to do the termiting thing. Whereas humans, because we have what we call high fidelity social transmission, uh, uh, are able to keep these innovations and, and cumulatively build on them until you reach in generating what is explicitly called sequential improvement over time. Uh, and you eventually wind up with cultural traits that are beyond the inventive capacity of any individual. Uh, and then once you get all this content out there to be learned, it, 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 it applies uh, a selective pressures for enhance, further enhancing social learning mechanisms and feeding back again onto uh, you know, uh, cumulative cultural, biocultural evolution. Uh, and so what's really kind of nice about this, this story is that it can help to explain a, something of a, a puzzle in human evolution, which is, I mean, if you think about 5 million years here, across uh, Africa, Asia, Europe, um, and somehow across all these different habitats and all this different time and all these different adaptations, the answer was always build a bigger brain, right? I mean, that doesn't make much sense, right? And make more complex technology, um, unless it's something endogenous to the system that hominids are taking with them into different contexts, right? So that's kind of neat. It sort of explains this perception of sustained autocatalytic feedback in, in human evolution. So if this is such a great thing, you know, big brains, 8 billion people, blah, 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 why don't other species do this is a common question that the cultural evolutionists uh, have uh, confronted. Um, and the, uh, the typical answer um, or the answer that's been developed is that uh, although it's great, it's hard to get it started, right? Because there's some critical requirement. Usually now people talk about high fidelity social learning. Um, that is very costly and, and, and unlikely to be discovered evolutionarily. But once you get it, you know, it's the, the critical breakthrough from like 2001 Space Odyssey, or it's, you know, Caesar crossing the Rubicon, you know, once you've done it, you go, and then we have this uh, sustained autocatalytic feedback. Um, but I want to take a moment to say that this kind of uh, troubles me a little bit, um, because this idea of, of a Rubicon in human evolution or a threshold or a a uh, unique human difference is a very old one. And it seems we keep coming up with something new, like it used to be it was tool use or the original use of Rubicon in human evolution was about a certain brain size. Now the idea that this special sauce for humans is, is, is social learning, it might be right, but this is a repetitive trope in human evolution that there's some key event, key difference, human uniqueness. Um, and it also carries with it quite a bit of uh, really triumphalism, human exceptionalism, concept that we're actually like progressing. You cross the Rubicon, there's no looking back, you know, we're on to, to glory and great things. Uh, so I do think we need to think a little bit about whether these, you know, very interesting and useful scientific concepts of cultural evolution and biocultural feedback get tied up with a non-scientific uh, concept of progress in human evolution that's incredibly deeply ingrained and just keeps coming back no matter how many times you say it. I mean, when people write about uh, uh, cumulative cultural evolution, they'll usually present some laundry list of achievements and literally say, these are you know, achievements, uh, stunning breakthroughs, wonderful things, space travel. I did it at the beginning of this lecture. You probably didn't bat an eye because you're used to hearing it, you know, symphonies. And they often read like laundry lists of whatever is culturally valued by whoever is writing about this progressive human evolution, you know, and they're like you know, the, the achievements of, of, of Western civilization. Um, and that's problematic because as soon as you have in ev evolution some kind of uh, uh, directionality or, you know, basically better and worse, it becomes possible for, well, these people over here are better and these are more advanced, less advanced. We know that this is a problem and has been repeatedly a problem in study of, of human evolution. Uh, we all know that when you talk about biological evolution, you shouldn't be talking about achievements and progress and improvements. That's not what biological evolution does. So why does it always keep coming back when we write about cultural evolution? And I want to, I'm not pointing my finger at anybody. This is a pervasive problem you pick, and this is me, right? Uh, you know, a few years ago. And basically as soon as you try to start uh, 
selling the importance of this idea to a broader audience, painting big swath pictures, you tend to fall into this language. It's exactly the wrong time to be talking about evolution in terms of improvement, remarkable successes, distinguishing our species, it's all very triumphalist uh, language that it should be avoided because it confuses us and it obscures uh, the evolutionary processes that we're trying to study. All right, so right, where does this persistent concept of progress come from? Uh, you know, so for I don't know, and 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 for years I've been sort of vaguely telling my students that uh, it's oh, it's this idiosyncratic uh, Western idea it came out of the Enlightenment. Maybe it was you know a, a ideological justification for overturning current power structures or something like that. But you know, I don't know why it's just so persistent and and so forth. Um, and then this summer I actually read the recent book from uh, Graeber and, and Wingro, and what they argued. I'm not a historian, but they were pretty convincing was that this concept actually arose out of the encounter um, with other cultures, and most specifically the indigenous critique, they call it, of uh, Native American thinkers like uh, Kondiarang here, um, who found European society when they encountered it to be pretty miserable um, and oppressive. And you have some people working all day to enrich others, other people dying in the streets. And so they pointed this out and they said, what you're doing is, is you know, not so great. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, according to uh, Wingro and, and, and Graeber, um, this actually hit home in the salons of Europe and caused some, some consternation and you know, maybe a little bit of self-reflection um, until the, uh, uh, this uh, economist, uh, uh, Turgo, uh, came up with the decisive rebuttal, um, which is that, yeah, yeah, that's fine, but this is just the necessary cost that we pay. Inequality, uh, you know, hardship for some, in order to make these great achievements of European society, like uh, complex cultures, symphonies, large urban uh, you know, settlements, uh, technology, complex technologies, and uh, particular socioeconomic systems. And so, yeah, again, I'm not sure completely accurate this is, but it was kind of uh, uh, convincing, but the point is that this is, the concept of progress is not neutral or obvious. It, in this, it emerges as a specific justification for a settle, settler, colonial, and uh, a capitalist world system. So yeah, take that as you will. You may agree or not agree or whatever, but I do think it highlights that we should be very careful when we apply concepts like improvements and progress to anything like cultural evolution. And I'm not the only one that's noticed that there's something a little fishy going on here. Uh, answering the question of what exactly is improving in cumulative cultural evolution is not so easy. You know, in biology, you can talk about fitness, and that's fairly objective. I prefer to just call it increase rather than improvement, but there's a principal way that you can relate fitness and call it, you know, fine. Um, but as, uh, as Masudi and Thornton point out, virtually all definitions of cumulative cultural evolution specify improvement as a requirement. Uh, this involves an improvement in some measure of performance, which is a proxy for a genetic or cultural fitness. Um, but we don't know what cultural fitness is. The notion of fitness is under theorized. Uh, does knowledge of quantum physics enhance the inclusive fitness of its bearers? That doesn't seem likely. Uh, so we then wind up using proxies like monetary or material wealth or social status. Uh, but how do we know what people are maximizing? You can either be circular and whatever persists is what's maximizing, that's not very helpful, or you wind up sort of making inferences, maybe projecting the things that you value, like wealth or social status, or the big one, complexity. You know, we always assume, in fact, in cultural evolutionary studies, often they dispense with fitness and just start directly talking about the evolution of complexity, as if complexity is necessarily an improvement rather than a cost. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. So if, for instance, you know, in a, in a recent uh, uh, paper, um, it was argued that uh, patterns of technological intensification over a long period here in, in, in the Levant were, were driven by the depletion of favored resources, right? Uh, sort of a red queen kind of effect. And now, so this is a form of biocultural feedback if you're extending your concept to include ecosystems. But the whole point of whether you consider this intensification to be an improvement or not or a fall from grace or, you know, losing the easy times. That's just, you know, that's your personal preference. This isn't a part of the scientific question. So we need to be really careful not to just sort of gloss things over as improvement and, and employ fuzzy, fuzzy concepts that can lead us into a lot of trouble.
okay, so you can say, fine, fine, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's got an ideological problem with progress, but these are facts, right? Uh, you know, brains got bigger, technology got more complicated, more people. Isn't that actually biological success? You know, however, you, you maybe you don't like it, but that, but, so, but, but the point is that I, I think we need to check our, our preconceptions and the filters with which we see this, this kind of evidence. Uh, so it looks pretty clear when you graph things like this, you know, that there's been a sort of a, you know, a steady and consistent uh, increase here. But if you actually start plotting data points, it gets a bit more messy. And particularly if you plot some recent finds of uh, very recent small brain hominids, this you know, sort of unilineal increase starts to look a lot more complicated. Um, and even to me, um, it's getting harder to argue that there's been a long-term directional trend as opposed to an increasing diversification over a, you know, eight grade sort of minimum brain size, right? Uh, we need a much better fossil record to really know if there's been this, you know, autocatalytic trend or whether it's really one of diversification. Um, you could say that the, the same thing about technology, but even more so because actually we don't know how to quantify technological complexity. And this is just a made up picture, not based on data. Um, but Glenn Isaac knew what he was uh, talking about the archeological record and what he saw. And what I think, you know, if you reflect what you, you would probably agree is actually, you don't see just an increase. You see an increase in diversity, right? A diversification is very different from a long-term trend in a particular direction. Uh, and furthermore, it's not clear that we're dealing with kind of one trend, one consistent, the, the biocultural feedback model is, is that you know, there's this one process that is continuous going on. But in fact, you know, it might be that you're having, instead of one long process, you're having a number of inflection points, right? Um, so speciation events. So it might be that there's really only like five events here that need to be explained. And there's no reason to suppose that each event should have the same explanation. And in fact, only two of them involve clear increases in brain size out of five. Um, and this one most recent involves a precipitous <laughs> drop in brain size recently, which I'm not sure what to, to say about that, uh, but might want to keep our eyes on that one. Uh, but the point is that events that happen at uh, that speciation, the kind of evolutionary causation may be very different from the long sustained uh, monotonic kind of uh, biocultural feedback that's envisioned by these models. And we might need particular explanations for particular events, not just one size fits all feedback explanation for the whole thing. So I don't have uh, as much of a story about uh, population growth because it is actually quite hard to, to argue with 8 billion people. Um, however, I do think we need to be careful uh, in assuming that uh, ancient human populations always maximized fitness. Uh, I mean, not fitness, uh, uh, fertility, um, because in fact, we know that modern human populations don't do that. Right, uh, and it's demographic transition. So people don't always choose to maximize fertility. Um, you know, agriculture doesn't always transform uh, population rates, and the uh, increases in in uh, 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 intensification may be as much a, an effect of uh, changes in population as they are a cause of it. So it's not always, you know, we can't just assume that something like technology is driving these population increase over the long term. And we should be open to the idea that past populations like modern populations made choices uh, about fertility rates. Um, so let's return then to this idea of the, the, the crossed uh, threshold or some kind of uh, uh, key event, right? Um, and uh, there is a uh, specific argument, um, uh, cultural evolutionary argument supporting this idea. Um, and it is, uh, based on the conception of culture. So we have to, in order to understand this argument, well, what is actually culture? Okay, this could really go on for a long, but the, they are very specific in the cultural evolutionary literature that culture is information, right? And it's information that is socially transmitted basically from brain to brain, uh, a copied or replicated. And the importance of this is that it, it, it allows you to say that culture acts like genes uh, it's a template copying thing. Information is cheap to store and replicate once it's acquired. Um, and that makes cultural evolution act like biological evolution. And in particular, there's a distinction between the social learning, which is uh, 
uh, cheap and easy if you have the mechanisms to support it. And the individual learning, which is more like less like uh, genetic replication and more like growth and development. You have to spend time individually trial and error uh, learning things. So this whole idea is basically there's a cheap social learning, you know, that requires costly brains, expensive individual learning that fruit flies can do, but it takes a long time and it's hard. And so if you accept that, you come up with the idea that these mechanisms of social transmission are absolutely key. And so this is illustrated by a thought experiment uh, called uh, the, the island test. And, and the idea you know, is it's supposed to in, uh, illustrate the importance of information copying and transmission. So if you were on this island, what could you successfully reinvent on your own if you didn't have the benefit of all the accumulated information and knowledge uh, of your, your, your culture? And so a lot of us could probably come up with a termiting stick or chimpanzee technologies, um, but nobody here is gonna reinvent you know, a, a smartphone. Right, because that requires generations of accumulated knowledge, and so this is the demonstration. And we can ask that about particular uh, 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 examples of technology and whether they're accumulative or not. Um, but I would ask you a separate question. So, like, let's assume that you're not just trapped on the island; you also have a smartphone with you, right? And now you can copy the smartphone if you want to. Uh, and let's say you also have service; you can call anybody, download plans, access to all the information worldwide about designing and building mobile phones. Now, in your lifetime, on your own, will you be able to make one? And the answer is still no, because information is not enough. You need materials, infrastructure, collaboration, all kinds of other things that have accumulated over time and are not just information. Um, and this is important because it breaks down that idea that information replication is the key thing about technological evolution. Right, so cultural evolutionary theorists know this, right? <laughs> These are not foolish people. Um, and here, so here is a, you know, just a table uh, 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 from an edited volume on cultural evolution, pointing out all the things other than, you know, information transmission, replication, and uh, you know, sort of population dynamics that can affect the rates of technological change, like intrinsic characteristics of the technology, how well it fits with prior knowledge, social institutions, and so forth. Very sensible. Right. Um, but the thing is that in the intellectual framework, these are treated as modifiers to the core process of information uh, uh, transmission um, and just sort of minor things, not in themselves of import, as important causal uh, factors. Um, and this is because the, the cultural uh, evolution uh, uh, paradigm is built on top of the modern synthesis of evolutionary biology, which uh, emphasizes uh, genetic replication as being the core aspect of, of, uh, of evolution. Right, um, which is ironic because cultural evolution is now one of the pillars of what people are calling an extended evolutionary synthesis, which explicitly critiques this approach to the modern synthesis. And according to people in the extended evolutionary synthesis, phenotypes are not inherited. You don't just like inherit genes and then print out, you know, a phenotype. They are reconstructed in a you know a creative process of development. And I would say the same about behaviors are not just copied; they are reconstructed or reproduced through elaborate, complicated processes of learning. And if we want to understand evolution, we have to understand the thing that actually produces the behaviors and not just gloss it as some kind of, uh, you know, easy copying, right? Um, so the implications of this for this uh, threshold uh, event are that uh, it seems, starts to seem less uh, compelling, right? So the argument for needing a threshold is basically that there's a startup problem. Uh, this was explained by uh, Henrik and, uh, and Tenney, and say, as they start in the beginning, which is a great way to start your argument, uh, before cumulative culture evolution got going, uh, there wouldn't have been very much, you know, valuable information out there, you know, and so there's a hump that we have to get over. And this is made worse by the fact that natural selection forces you to choose between either individual learning or social learning, because they are two different things, two different mechanisms. And so it's really hard to, you know, get this going where you've invested in the social learning before there's a lot of great stuff out there to learn. There's a hump to get over. That's the startup problem, right? That this is based on an assumption that there's a rigid dichotomy between individual learning and, and social learning, which in my experience is awfully hard to find in the real world. I mean, you can, you can specify in a cultural evolutionary model parameters for these things quite rigorously, easily, you know, but so here are some people out back in my lab um, in a study that we did trying to teach them uh, to make uh, hand axes. So what's going on here? I mean, 
are these two involved in individual learning right now? And they're involved in social learning. Uh, you know, and if he looks up, he's going to switch from individual to social learning, you know, turn on a dime. Or is this all social learning because these people wouldn't even be here or have these materials or those chairs or that objective without a whole big complex set of uh, social institutions and interactions? You know, where is the, the, the social and the individual uh, learning here? Uh, in fact, you know, uh, uh, learning technological skills in, in particular is uh, much more complex and individual and social processes are very thoroughly interwoven uh, throughout it. It's not a period, a, a instantaneous copying. It's a long period of, of, of the reproduction across individuals of technical skills. And this is you know, exemplified by apprenticeship type learning. You know, and there's all kinds of things going on that again are like, is this, you know, is this social, is this individual? Um, you know, you have uh, social resources um, in terms of observable performance, but also contexts, uh, artifacts, situations that have been produced by technological activity in the past that now provide a scaffold for you to learn in the present. Um, you have uh, the importance of individual practice being interleaved with the observation of others. Um, you have uh, all sorts of effect, affective encouragement and so forth. Anyway, it's really complicated and you can't pick it apart uh, very easily and say this is social and that's individual. And it takes a long time to do. Right. So given that this sort of social individual dichotomy is so hard to actually uh, identify in the, in the real world, perhaps it's not so surprising that it doesn't seem to be segregated out into different neural systems either. All right. So I won't go into any great detail here, but this is, you know, this figure from a uh, recent review of uh, uh, the neural and computational systems of social learning. And what I just want to point out is that this uh, kind of red, reddish color here is supposed to be the dedicated social learning systems, and you've got that right there. It's a little bit of the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, which is the only area that I identified as maybe being particularly spe specialized for social learning, uh, basically uh, uh, extracting rewards um, from the observation of, of others. Um, and that actually was identified in research with monkeys. So it's not really a great you know, seat of human uh, uniqueness. Um, so the what this does for the startup hypothesis is it actually seemed more likely that if you increased individual learning capacities, you would at the same time be increasing social learning capacities and vice versa, rather than having a trade off from the two of them, because they involve a lot of the same processes like reinforcement learning supported by the, the same systems. Right. So instead of thinking about one key thing that makes human uh, technological evolution possible, we should be thinking about the diverse things that make the evolution of different human technologies uh, possible, which are going to involve you know, different uh, cognitive requirements, different uh, social uh, arrangements and infrastructure and different material um, and you know, a lot of complexity. And there's not going to be one size fits all kind of answer to this, which you know, might be kind of distressing. Um, discouraging if you'd really like to have some coherent and generalizable theory of technological evolution, because it seems to, oh, it's basically it's history. It's a whole lot of particular things, and every case is different. So I do want to suggest that it may be possible to synthesize these things uh, a little bit um, by uh, focusing on what I see as the see key characteristics of technology as, as a domain of human behavior that we're trying to distinguish from others. Um, and one of the key ones is that it involves uh, material production. Um, you know, so what I'm doing right now is in technology, I'm trying to change your mind. It's, you know, all very, uh, very cognitive and, uh, and ephemeral, but the, the technologies uh, would involve actual physical material production. Um, they are, are different from things like uh, simple tool use or just uh, foraging behavior or whatever, because they, they involve almost always some form of, of collaboration between individuals, and they're also socially reproduced, often in very complex ways. And so that's the domain I'm talking about. Those are its characteristics. Um, the materiality of technology is very important uh, because uh, these concrete artifacts are durable and they're outside the body, um, and they create an additional uh, 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 avenue for cultural inheritance. I inherit not just ideas from you, but I actually inherit your workshop, your tools. It's organized in a certain way. These it, it helps me to learn some things I don't have to remember because the way the workshop is laid out does that for me. And this allows for the, and, and it's durable, and this allows for the construction of very long action sequences 
um, and uh, complexity of actions that are, again, beyond what one individual can hold in their mind all at one time. You don't have to do that because it's out there in the world. So the materiality of technology is very important. And what allows us to have this materiality is the incredibly refined abilities that humans have for perceiving and acting in their world, right? And so a lot of this uh, ability that we have to interact with objects is thought to be based on the use of internal models of the world uh, that allow us to, uh, to, to predict and control our behaviors. So, I mean, if you think about it, like you don't often notice these, right? If you go to pick up like a, you know, a teapot here, is this, that's what this illustration is here. And you think it's full of water. You reach out, you grab it and jerk it up because you had a prediction, an internal model of how much force it would require. And it was wrong. And so you very, so you, you, you did your action. You made your predictions of what should happen. The actual thing that happened didn't match your prediction. So, you know, you have to go back and change your internal model and you can adjust. And all this happens very rapidly. It's what allows you to do fluid actions that are too fast if you had to think about every step and wait for feedback because you're engaged in prediction. So humans are very good at this. Um, it appears to be uh, supported by a uh, dorsal uh, system of uh, especially vision, um, but other modalities as well for action um, that communicates particularly between the, uh, the parietal lobe uh, and the inferior frontal lobe and supports what you might call a uh, mental physics engine for understanding the world. And I'm pointing this out, the anatomy here, because this is also a system that my colleague Aaron Hecht has shown has greatly enlarged and become more complex in human evolution. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're particularly good at interacting with the world in a way that supports our complex technologies. Yeah, so here's some more work from, uh, um, from Aaron Hecht uh, showing, you know, that uh, already compared to monkeys, this system is, is enlarged in chimpanzees, um, but in humans, it is much more uh, elaborate that, that supports our, our fine-grained uh, and very uh, uh, skilled physical actions. But what's also very important about this system is it's thought not just to be involved in actual control of action, because you're making predictions about your own actions, you have internal models of actions, you can actually use that to understand the actions of others that you observe. Because you know you can you can take visual feedback of your own actions and begin to relate it to the predictions that you made. You can take visual feedback from a demonstrator and relate it to your own motor programs that you have. And by going back and forth, you can learn things from them, right? So this is kind of the mirror neuron mirror system thing that probably most of you have, have heard of. Uh, but it's a simulation based uh, account of some aspects of social cognition and learning would it, would it implicate this same system, right? And so in my own lab. We try to understand the evolution of the system by focusing on stone tool making, um, because that's something that we have a record of uh, archaeologically. We can actually see, you know, uh, a tool that was made two million years ago and look at things like the amount of, uh, of motor precision that was required, potentially some aspects of planning and like that. And we can understand it then in the lab uh, by doing it today and applying uh, neuroscience and behavioral science methods to understanding that behavior. Right. And so you won't be surprised. The big, most consistent result from the years that I've been doing this is that stone tool making, whether you're talking about actually doing it, whether you're talking about watching it, whether you're talking about plastic effects on, uh, on neuroanatomy related to training, uh, uh, seems to implicate quite consistently this system, the frontal parietal connections, inferior frontal gyrus, especially in the right hemisphere. Um, we try to, what, what is it that's going on here? It has to do something with the, the control of action. Uh, we did a, uh, a study in which we uh, actually tried to, to parse the structure of tool making action sequences um, by assigning each action a number or letter or whether, you know, some kind of ID, and then you can construct sequences of them. Uh, you can use uh, uh, automatic uh, parsing methods, like, for instance, uh, hidden Markov modeling and uh, context-free grammar fitting are what we used in this, uh, in this study to you know, look for the hierarchical structural sequences in uh, the structures in, this, uh, in these sequences. Um, and then we can see how does the brain respond to increasing and decreasing complexity of these uh, these sequential structures. And again, uh, that result specifically, you know, produces the you know, inferior frontal cortex in some areas of, uh, of parietal. So again, the same system that we've been talking about. I think it has to do with understanding complex uh, sequential uh, actions. 
right? And to, so this, I, you know, this I, I love this system. You know, we thought it would be important. It does seem to be important. And we went back and did more fine-grained analyses comparing humans and chimpanzees. Um, and in particular, the system that I was just talking about, the connections with the inferior frontal gyrus is expanded in humans, protrudes more anteriorly, uh, and especially even more so in the right hemisphere, which is precisely what we we're seeing in the in the, in the tool making. Uh, so we have this really fascinating situation in which the uh, evolutionary changes in the anatomy that we get from comparative studies directly parallel the effects of tool making training in, in modern human uh, participants. Right? And so we get this fascinating is that so are these evolutionary differences due to, you know, selection over time? Are they because we all grow up in a very rich sort of technological uh, niche that we've constructed and these are plastic combinations. What's the interaction between culture and evolution in this, this feedback relationship? And to, to try to you know, unpick that a little bit, we need to consider some of the other uh, distinctive aspects of, of human technology um, that it involves collaboration. So I've already mentioned that these uh, uh, systems for motor production can also be involved in uh, perceiving the actions of others. And this may uh, provide the foundation um, for many forms of uh, social cognition and collaboration. Collaboration is, of course, evident in our modern technologies quite clearly, but also in, in many more ancient ones. Um, and at a sort of a, a micro level, this sort of inter human interaction social cognition is thought to be uh, uh, supported by the alignment of internal models between individuals. It's kind of a brain-to-brain a -brain coupling where you're predicting my actions, I'm predicting your actions. Our brains actually come to be synchronized. Um, and so this, this inter-individual uh, synchronization and, and connection, which is mediated by our sensory channels, right? It has to come through vision and hearing and all of that. Uh, it's not telepathy, but we, these perceptual motor uh, inputs allow us to synchronize and allow for the developmentally uh, uh, things like empathy, maybe theory of mind in the moment for collaborations. And these are the, the foundations for more complex sorts of collaborations where people, many people are coordinating their actions, um, where you get emergent uh, uh, group properties, uh, the, the alignment of, of, of values, of objectives, uh, and all of these things that support complex uh, technological activities like uh, piloting a uh, merchant marine vessel, for instance. Um, so this kind of alignment of internal models is, uh, is also important in the sense of the perception of differentiating the self from the other. Um, so you think about it, you predict your own actions, you make uh, 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 predictions, you get feedback as to whether what you're observing matches your own action. If what you're observing matches what you intended to do, that's you. You did that. Right. You can think about like if you're using a computer virtual reality, what makes you feel like you're projected into that space is that when you do something, your avatar does it. Right. So in the lab, you can do this much more low tech, for instance, the famous rubber hand illusion. Um, so you've got somebody with their, their hand is actually underneath the table. But on top of the table is this rubber hand, kind of realistic looking. You brush the finger of the rubber hand at the same time that under the table, not visible, their actual hand is being brushed. People very rapidly come to perceive this hand as their own, so much so that if you threaten the hand, we don't do this in my lab, by the way, but if you threaten the hand, you get a fear response from threatening a rubber hand on a table because people have incorporated into their body image. Uh, somewhat more uh, uh, controversially, this, you know, so moving together may uh, help to create social bonds, erode the sense of individual difference between because my body predictions are in your doing it, where is the line? Uh, between us. So you can sort of play with those things through synchronized uh, actions, right? Uh, so the classic test of a uh, sense of self in uh, non-humans is the mirror self-recognition test, right? Do, you know, who is the monkey in the mirror, right? Uh, so chimpanzees can sometimes do this, but what is required uh, uh, for you to be able to do that? And I would argue that it's the ability to recognize that when the thing in the mirror moves, that's me, right? Because it's matching my predictions, body, you know, this is synchronized, right? So the same sort of uh, uh, system that's involved in stone tool production, the social cognition and so forth, right? And in fact, going back again to the, the work of, uh, of my colleague, Aaron, Aaron Hecht, um, they compared chimpanzees that did uh, not 
get the mirror thing, those that were kind of sometimes maybe and those that were pretty good at it. And they found that the anatomical differences between these individuals were precisely in this very same, the anterior extension of the third branch of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, right? So the same thing that's implicated in stone tool making here is, you know, there's chimpanzee studies or all the studies that we've done over the years. Um, so that might seem like sort of, sort of weird and counterintuitive that it would be overlapping, but you know, there's a lot of functions that are kind of packed into a small area of, of cortex here um, that range from, uh, from reasoning to action control to execution to observation to social cognition. And my argument is the reason that they're all clustered together is because they're all doing different things with similar embodied information about, uh, uh, about action planning and control that's coming from the, uh, the, the parietal lobe, right? So overlapping systems again. So that then brings us to the question of, of reproduction, which is uh, really just a, a, a special case of collaboration, I would say. Uh, um, but we're here, we're trying to actually reproduce uh, skills. And again, the study we did, um, people learning to make hand axes, we provided them with like 90 hours of training, which was the best we could do, and looked at um, how their behavior changed over that time. We collected brain scans that they'd be before training, in the middle of training, and after training to see if there were changes in uh, neuroanatomy uh, as well. Um, but the question is, like, they got better. Okay, that's good. <laughs> There's some question there. So, <laughs> but they, yeah, so they did learn something. Um, as you can see here, they didn't get it at all close to the sort of expert production that would require to make something like this. But, you know, there's a pretty classic learning curve um, that we documented of them getting better over time. But what exactly did they learn that made them get better at hand axe making? Uh, so to try to unpack that a little bit, we, in addition to having them make hand axes and then we evaluate those products, we had them do a more controlled task um, in which you take a, a, a core and you are going to remove five flakes as if you're trying to make it into a hand axe. Um, but the trick is we actually, we give them a Sharpie and they're supposed to mark where they're gonna hit it and what's gonna happen when they hit it, All right? So you can actually then see how well their understanding of thought about what should happen matches up with what does happen and also whether they even hit what they're aiming at, All right? So first test, in fact, the ability to produce just flakes successfully in this task lined up pretty well with improvements in hand axe making. So, so just, just being able to do what you wanna do is a very important part of learning how to make a hand axe. Again, we, science, we try to demonstrate things that are obvious. But uh, uh, so, and, and what really did change over learning, what the most important change was just that they started hitting what they were aiming at their predictions were actually quite reasonable, even from the outset. So like this sort of conceptual knowledge, whatever, these supposed to be very fancy, is apparently you know, fairly intuitive, at least for modern humans. But you, know, you can't succeed if you keep missing and breaking the piece in the wrong place, right? So this is what, you know, pretty clear increase over time uh, in their accuracy of percussion. You know, on the other hand, it, we realized, as I said, it wasn't really about the choices they made in terms of where they were going to hit it um, and the outline, but particularly where they're going to hit it, it's not like they chose places you couldn't get a flake off. Uh, this is, gets a little complicated because it's kind of hard to evaluate um, flakes that didn't come off, you know? Uh, but what we did is we used some models and trained them on the expert uh, performance to be able to predict whether the target that people had selected wasn't a reasonable one that would have come off if an expert had done it. Um, versus a stupid one that wouldn't have even come off for an expert, right? And what we found that, that basically um, there were very few predictions when we applied this model that said that was a stupid choice and even an expert wouldn't have been able to get it off. Basically, it said, well, all of these, they've chosen viable targets, but they just failed to achieve basically because they missed. We can talk more. I know that's a little complicated, but we can talk more. The, the bottom line was that it's not this sort of conceptual knowledge, it's the motor coordination, the perceptual motor execution, at least at these stages of learning, that's absolutely key. And that just takes time, All right? So the other thing that fascinated me about this study and the question is to, okay, that's the group, right? And they learned, and these are some of the things, but what drove individual variation in who learned better or worse? And that's key because that's your lever to start talking about evolutionary processes, right? And mechanisms. The variation is the foundation, it's the raw material um, for evolution. And so, as I mentioned before, we collected brain scans. We actually also asked people about prior experience. Um, and one of the findings that was maybe a little surprising 
is that some of the people in our study, um, because fortunately we didn't limit ourselves to undergraduates and recruited from a broader community, some of the people in our study actually had some other craft skills, uh, you know, like uh, carpentry or sculpture or uh, uh, ceramics. Um, and we found that the ones that had uh, 10 years or more of experience started off much better, right? They had a higher aptitude at this task. And also the plastic changes in their brain that happened during learning happened faster. So there was something about this prior experience that prepared people, prepared the ground for them to learn this new task. And in a sense, they learned how to learn certain kinds of tasks. Right. So our measure. Uh, so this was an effect. So this is before training, the state of your brain as you come into the study. Uh, and we found that uh, uh, white matter integrity in this uh, ventral pathway between left inferior frontal gyrus and the temporal lobe um, predicted the quality of your initial performance uh, pretty, pretty, pretty tightly. And that both the anatomy and the, the, the hand axe quality were associated with how much prior craft experience you had. Uh, so furthermore, this effect of the years of, of prior experience with something we call a gross motor craft, because like having experience with knitting or sewing or something like that was more of a fine or crocheting, uh, was not, uh, didn't have this effect. So these are sort of gross motor things. And it was almost entirely mediated by the effect of the experience on the brain rather than being a direct effect of the experience on your, your sort of transfer to the task, right? So what this is indicating is that spending years doing these things changes your brain in a way that makes it easier for you to pick up other tasks that are sufficiently similar, right? The fact that this is in what we call this ventral stream uh, 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 of, of processing, um, suggests that it has to do with more abstract sort of semantic uh, generalizable um, uh, representations of actions and uh, hand object interactions, right, as opposed to uh, specific motor details. And of course, the ability to rapidly grasp the sort of abstract structure of a new task that you're trying to learn is precisely what would, would give you a, a leg up starting the process of learning the particular motor skills for that task. Right. And in fact, that's what we see. So now, uh, thankfully, we're back to the right hemisphere frontal parietal thing that I love so much. This is what changed during training. So you had your aptitude related to this left hemisphere system, and then that kickstarted your learning. You started off better in your brain in this network that's probably more responsible for the motor execution changed faster. You know, the FA, the, well, actually, it's a, a different measure of, uh, of white matter uh, integrity that we used here. Um, but it increased over the, the, the training period and faster in those that had a better start, right? So what, I'm, what we suggested out of this um, is that this provides a candidate of a potential specific mechanism um, for biocultural feedback, you know, such that acquiring some kinds of skills plastically changes your brain in a way that makes it easier for you to acquire and potentially innovate other related skills um, which leads to a, a profusion of more of these kind of skills in your social group, which means that each individual growing up in that social group is being exposed more and more to these, which produces plastic effects, maybe, uh, you know, a Baldwinian sort of effects of, uh, of canalizing this in development, and it, and it, it feeds back then to further enhance uh, your ability to, to acquire tasks. So learning to learn, um, uh, uh, technological skill acquisition fa facilitating further technological skill acquisition and resulting in anatomical changes in, or mediated by anatomical changes in the brain, right? So this is one particular aspect of the, the bigger picture idea that I'm trying to advance, which is that uh, uh, a lot of the things that we're interested in in human cognition and human evolution that are conceived uh, to be very highly abstract and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like complex cognition and language and all this, have their foundation, they're built developmentally, evolutionarily on top of shared primate systems um, and increasingly refined systems for perception and action and interaction with the world, right? So under this uh, hypothesis, basically, you've got systems that support action in the world, which support material production of technologies, but also develop uh, support the development of social cognition 
over your lifetime, which supports the formation of the social bonds, social networks, which provide the context for technological elaboration, um, which creates more technologies, which favor the evolution of enhancement, and so forth, around and around this, but feedback kind of thing, and particularly focusing on systems in that we know in primate brains have become particularly elaborated in humans. Uh, so I do want to return to this idea, though, it's starting to sound quite a bit progressive again there. And the point is that we're identifying feedback relationships that can happen. This doesn't mean that once they start, they always happen, never stop. They always apply in every context, right? Um, so these are relationships that can be realized. And so from this perspective, it's not a problem, for instance, that the Paleolithic might be very stable over long periods of time, right? We might equally well ask what's so bizarre about our modern context that is so radically unstable, right? So there's no assumption that these feedback things should always happen. Whether or not a particular feedback mechanism occurs is going to depend on particular histories. So evolutionary explanation requires both the histories and the general recurring mechanisms. And we have to put those together to generate evolutionary explanations. It's not enough to just have this happen, that happened, this happened. And it's not enough to say there is biocultural feedback. You have to go to each of these nodes and figure out how these general mechanisms play out in uh, particular contexts. Um, and so that, to me, is how you would take a step toward a more general evolutionary science of technology. Uh, as you can see from, from what I've been saying today, this is going to be an inherently multidisciplinary effort. Um, it's very much, you know, any kind of evolutionary science is going to require a comparative approach that focuses on variation at multiple levels, individual, group, species, so on. Um, we must embrace the real world complexity because it's not going to go away. We can't ignore it. The variation and the particularism of some of the things that we're interested in. Uh, this is going to mean, and the scale of technological uh, production and reproduction, it means we need long-term studies, which is also unfortunate, but just true. Like, okay, so this is hard to do, but we have to, we have to think long-term. Um, and uh, we need both the broad comparative work and the detailed case studies. So this is part of the multidisciplinary effort, even, you know, everything from, from, from uh, you know, ethnography to uh, uh, phylogenetics has a place in this uh, endeavor. Um, and hopefully there is some hope for doing these very difficult things with new and emerging methods for data collection uh, in, in real world, you know, sort of uh, portable uh, uh, neuroimaging, but things like instantaneous uh, uh, ecological reporting, uh, digital phenotyping, monitoring behavior through wearable devices or just the phones that we all carry around anyway. Can maybe the, and, and of course, the ability to process these incredibly big and complex uh, uh, sets of data. Uh, gives me some hope for the future, even though this is a big ask. This is a difficult thing uh, to do. Um, but on balance, I'm I'm excited by the the prospects, and I hope that you are also. So thank you very much.